welcome okay. to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. And today's show is brought to you by Herman Marshall Whiskey, Texas, Dallas County's first distillery of handcrafted award-winning small batch whiskey. Patiently aged in new white oak barrels in the great state of Texas. It's built from the grain up, just like good whiskey and better friends should be. Herman Marshall, they're building a new facility in Wiley, guys. We need to check this out. It's going to open in spring. They're going to have an outdoor venue, and it is going to be a very, very impressive facility that they have set up. They've got a blend, they've got a, a bourbon, and they've got a rye here. So I, I encourage you guys to check that out. And also brought to you by Early Bird CBD. This, uh, go to earlybirdcbd.com and put in Big Head Pod. You get 20% off your first order. And it's any orders usually at 3 p.m. that day will be shipped that day. And this stuff helps me actually sleep better at night. And it helps with my sore aching joints because I'm so old these days. So check that out as well. Like I said, anytime you guys are online, check it out. So today's guest, this is a little bit different here. This man is been around the baseball world for a long, long time, um, and he is recently the proud grandfather, and we will get to that in a minute, but right now, I want to introduce the great John Hirschbeck. Johnny, how are you, sir? I'm great, Kevin. Thank you. It's nice to be on your show and see you again. Yes, sir. It's been a long time. So you retired in what year? I retired right after the World Series in 16, Cleveland and... Um, uh, his brain, my senior moment, <laughs> oh, Lord, uh, Cleveland and Chicago. The Cubbies. Oh, so you did get the chance to see the Cubbies win the World Series. Were you behind the plate I, in I Game did. 7? No. They, Joe Torre, when he was in charge, did it differently. He always wanted the crew chief to be to start on second base, um, thinking that was more games you were in the middle of the infield. So the last time I worked Game 1 was in 13, and the Red Sox and Cardinals went – Six games, so I finished at first base and had it gone seven, and that's the last year. Now they have seven umpires. So uh, that old thing of working two plate jobs is gone forever. Gosh, that's that's where we're headed today with all this this umpiring stuff. So now you know, as as a growing up, you know, people, what made you decide to be an umpire, John? Were you in, were you an athlete, or are you just one of those guys? You just something kind of steered you in that direction, or what? How do you become? an umpire and then get to that point where you were now? That's a great question because my story is really unusual. I was a senior in high school. I grew up in Connecticut. I was in a small town. I was a senior in high school and I needed money to go to my prom. So there was a guy in town. He said, you know, if you come and umpire Little League games, we'll pay you $5 a game. Now this was 1972. So that wasn't all that bad as far as money. And um, I hadn't played since I was 12. And uh, I did it that year. And then he called me a week later. He said, hey, we need an umpire in chief. I said, what's that mean? He said, well, you've got to set up all the umpires for all the Little League games in town. So I did it. And I said, does that mean I can schedule myself whenever I want? And he goes, yeah, sure. So I did it like, you know, seven days a week. And I really enjoyed it. Just something that God opened the door and I, I enjoyed it. So I went to college the next year and I started doing, joined an association doing 18 years and under. And... Um, Watching games on TV, I thought, well, how do guys ever get to do it on TV at the major league level? And um, there were no computers or anything then where you could look it up. But I found out there were two schools in Florida, and um, one was in Daytona Beach, and, and it ran from January for six weeks into February. So my senior year, I went down. I kind of left school. I ended up finishing second in my class out of 149 guys. And... Um, was lucky enough to get a job right in a ball and then it started my minor league career in a so which uh which academy was it uh, um i went to uh, actually it was al summers umpire school that was the last year the the old al summers who was a career triple a umpire never actually made it to the big leagues but then dedicated himself his life really to training umpires and um harry wendelstadt at the time was his head guy, part owner, chief instructor. And then the following year it became Wendelstadt Umpire School. And I actually taught there for 10 years. After we had our second child, I said, and I was in the big leagues, I said, I got to stop doing this. I need to be home in the winter. So, so you, so after college, you spent how many years in the minor leagues before you got to the big leagues? Seven. I spent two in A, one in double A, and four in triple A. Um, because then more or less they're waiting for an opening. Is trying not to screw up. 
so I so I could get to the big leagues, but they were watching me, so I was I was fortunate. So they that was back when they had two leagues. Did, were the umpires separated by league at that point, or were you guys still interchangeable? Yes. No, that that didn't happen until 2000. So up until then, it was American League, National League, and um, I spent my first 17 years as an American League umpire, and then my second 17 years doing both. Yes, yeah, so I remember seeing the World Series. You know, they said from. AL umpires, you know, NL umpires and everything yeah. else. Were you a fan of the two league way set up or did you like the, the fact when they, when they inter, intermix where you could go both with uh, national league and American league? I liked it when they intermixed, um, you know, Kevin, it did away with a lot of the BS stuff, like two different strike zones and different rule interpretations and which would become such a big controversy during world series time. And the sport didn't need that. And that was the one, first good thing. Um, the second was, you know, for the, my second 17 years, I got to go to different cities. And at the time, there was no DH, uh, of course, in the National League. And at the time, they played a lot quicker games. It was more on pitching. And the game of baseball, the way I think I know that I loved it, you know, where bunning and a lot more managing went on. It's not that way anymore, I don't think. So they've so you run four umpires during the regular season playoffs. They run mm -hmm. six. Has it always six. been six, or is that just something that's been in the last 20, 30 years where they've added multiple um, more, more than just the regular four? It's always been six, and with that rotation where the plate uh, the crew chief would start on the plate and then work his way around. When you're done with the plate, you go right field line, left field line, then third, second, first, and then if there was a game seven. Now there are seven umpires. Um, and I just found out the other day because I was talking to James Hoy, a good friend who had he had the plate in game one. And um, he will. Be, so you work and then you go in that same rotation and then you're off. Now he'll be off game seven. He doesn't have to work that one. So they if sit, it goes that far. Yeah. So they have some what that are in the stands or they in 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 the, They're in the locker room in the, They're locker, in the locker room. In if, case. if someone got hurt, then they can get dressed quick and come out on the field. Okay, and then, but the replay stuff all goes up into New York, right? Is that all correct? goes to New York. I believe there's three people up there for that. Are they former umpires, or are they? Oh, just... they're all current active umpires. Oh, they are. Okay, so you have. So to... In other words, the list comes out. Seven guys are announced as the the World Series umpires, and I think it's three, but they're announced as the replay umpires. So during the year, then they, the same thing that they have to rotate through that, or is it just? You know, anyway. When you pick your schedules, um, it goes by seniority with crew chiefs. And as you pick your schedule, one of the things you pick are the, the weeks that you get in replay. And, and normally, I think most guys try and get three. Some The way it works out, some can only get two. But um, the nice thing is to have three off because you're in replay rather than being on the field. So you've seen baseball from from a long ways. And, and as, a, as a player... I was I'm not a fan of the of instant replay. I understand the camera angles and you know the way the game is, right? It's 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 going to be there's going to be human error, human element. It's just a part of it. What I mean, what are your thoughts on it, you know, from just for one being behind the plate and then the way the game is played throughout as far as, you know, taking guys out, you know, the plays at the plate and everything else. What are your thoughts on all that, John? Um here's my line when in 2000, it when MLB took over Major League Baseball. So in other words, instead of my paycheck coming out of the American League office in New York, it came from Major League Baseball. We were all under one roof. And I always said that, look out, because lawyers are taking over the game. And I think they're, they, I know they're people without really knowledge of the game. Um, they're lawyers. And the rule book, when I taught at umpire school, I was in charge of the class. And I used to tell kids for, right away, don't try to read this like you're in school or you're trying to you know understand it you have to understand it was written years ago by people who understood the game so you have to understand the intent of the rule that way you can make a split second decision on the field when you have to and now if you looked at the rule book it's written by lawyers just totally changed and that being said i i just i just think that um i'm more old school you know i, I came to the big leagues in 1983 um and I think that the game has changed. Replay is good. I think the original thought on replay was, let's not have that one controversial call in a big game that changes the outcome because of a person's decision. And, and that theory is okay, but as soon as it started, 
you just knew it was going to keep going and going and going, which it has in the last 22 years. And, you know, now they're talking about the strike zone and, you know, robot strike zone and all that kind of stuff. So I, um, I thank God, Kevin, every day that my career was when it was, and I retired when I did. I got to see a little bit of the modern day stuff, but um, I'm just thankful that uh, my career was when it was. And you, I mean, it's it's basically it's they've taken control away from the umpires themselves, right? They have to in the back. I mean, I'm sure it has to be in the back of their mind, you know, a borderline call. Oh gosh, what you know? What what are my numbers going to say? Right, and the first thing, don't, isn't there a, is there an app or something that they go to to be able to check it, or how do they? I know you, this is yeah. after you, but is it is it an app that they check? Well, when I left in '16, you got a report the next day, so you went on your laptop and you could see your evaluation. So you might have, you know, been thinking that night, boy, I had a good game tonight. You know, you have to be honest with yourself, and then find out the next day that you weren't. And I was always a pitcher's umpire, always. And there's a, a buffer zone of two inches, if it's still like that, and I believe it is. Um, and I would try and get every pitch I could that was in that buffer zone, because I was trying to be call strikes. And I think umpires nowadays, or young guys before I left, they would try to ball those pitches and be so exact and look at that as a missed pitch when they called one in the buffer zone. And if they had 14 or 15 of those, I'd go like, good job. That's the way, way to get strikes. Um, too precise now. And you know, talking to younger hitters now, it, the whole thinking process of the game, I mean, if it's not, the easy way to beat that machine is just think like, is that definitely a strike? And if not, say ball and you'll score well. Yeah, and you're, and it's, you're right. I mean, it's as an umpire, yeah, just me, you know, seeing this as, you know, if, if a guy's going to consistently throw a pitch in the same spot, right, you might not give it to him the first pitch, but if he consistently shows the same spot, right, that you're going to, are you going to give it to him if they can show you that they can continuously throw strikes as opposed to being just erratic at all over the place, correct? Correct. But it's, it's not, you know, you can go back and this is a, a popular question. People say, well, Greg Maddox, earned that he he got that pitch no Greg Maddox did that all the time and if I have a kid that I had in spring training and he's pitching and he's throwing that pitch just on the corner I'm going to give him the exact same strike zone that I would give to Greg Maddox you don't have to earn that I'm just there to do my job and be as consistent as possible so guys in the dugout guys coming up they know like okay He's going to get that outside corner pitch. Let's not say it was off the plate. Let's just say it's outside corner. Um, but Greg Maddox throws it three inches off the plate all night. No, I'm going to ball it. But Greg Maddox is big, good enough then to bring it two inches in to be an inch off the plate. That's the difference. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan of, you know, if it touches an angle of the front corner of the plate that it's a strike. I mean, it could come across and – Guys got no chance to hit it yet by the right by the zone that they have. It's it's considered yeah. a strike and everything else. So I mean, and, and it's, I mean, and as a hitter, your first thought is you want to turn around and yell at the umpire, but at the same time, it's that's what these this rule is saying. You know, it's making it. It's like you said, it's too precise, right? There's no, you know, human error at all. Of where, you know, having a conversation of going up or something, you know, first pitch of it outside, and, and I turn around and say, "Hey, Johnny, is that as far out as you're going to go?" Just so I would know my, for myself of knowing, all right, what where the zone's going to be set, right? So the game, so I would know from the game of going that way, and if something happened, you know, beyond that, and you say, "Well, hey, right," you, you're able to have those conversations, and it, as opposed to really, I mean, it's not like some some of these guys now. It's almost that like they don't even turn around and say anything. They they lose their head as soon as they even take take a look back at an umpire right oh then they go in and they, they come out and then they'll they'll say like i looked at that that's an inch outside you know and but getting back to your question first of all i don't ever remember you yelling at an umpire and the other thing you said is you would say hey john is that as far as you're gonna go that's how i if i talk to groups or the people or young players that's the way you should talk to an umpire not like, you know, where was that one or what the, you know, not in a demeaning way. Just say, hey, is that as far as you were going to go? And that's how I remember you, Kevin. Yeah, exactly. And um, so if if I don't answer that as a man and respect you as a man, then I'm the jerk. So and I would try to never, ever be that way unless a guy was got nasty on you. 
Yeah, you're right. And it's and, and that's the thing of being able to it's it's that interaction. It's the respect of, of the umpire of knowing, you know, hey, that's it's, it's hey blue, this and that. And I, I even my kids, I say, hey, they don't say hey blue, just say no. hey, say excuse me, or I'll tell them. Just say hey off, off or officer, uh, hey uh, whatever your name, just say hey, can you move this? Perfect, right? It's, yeah. They don't want to respond to that because it's it's not. It's just, I think it's disrespectful just saying hey. Hey, blue. Hey, ref. Hey, um, can you move this and that? No, be, right? Yeah, because it's. I, I agree. I agree, and it's also you knowing and guys on the bench. You know, there's 25 players over there. If um, another question comes up, well, would would you give George Brett a tighter strike zone than someone else? Than you? No, absolutely not. You have the same strike zone, and you call the same pitch a strike in the ninth inning that you do in the first inning. You don't expand it. You don't condense it. You just, the players know like, okay, this is, and you guys know on the bench right away, you can see high and low, first of all. And, um, you know, back then we laid off the high pitch and gave the low pitch more because a successful pitcher is taught to then to keep the ball down in the strike zone. Um, nowadays, I don't know. Yeah. And knowing too, right. If, if a game's getting completely out of hand, right. It's 15, 20 to nothing, right. You, you guys will, will go, will say something even to the catch. Hey, we're going to open the zone up a little bit, right. Just because, right. We're not, I, nobody's getting anything. I've heard, you know, that some do, some don't, right. That they will do that just because. I, I, honestly, I've never ever in my life done that. I'll tell you a funny story in a second, only because again, consistency. Yeah. I, I wanted people to think like, not only how I treated people on the field, but my calls behind the plate were going to be the same. And those kind of games, you just – now, when it might change is when you get a second baseman and they put him into pitch. Um, I might tell the guys as they step in, now let's – got to be swinging now, right? Let's go. That kind of thing. But um, I, I would never – try to never change what I called and just to be as consistent as possible. So when I walked on the field, they know – you know, Joe Torre told me once, he said, when you walked on the field, we knew we were going to get a fair deal. And then players knew, like, okay, we know what his strike zone is going to be like. So even though I was under the, the rules at the end of the automated strike zone to try and perform, I was happy if I scored 93-94 and got all those pitches in the buffer zone um, and where other younger guys are trying to score 98, 99, 100. I mean, I never came near 100 in my life. So. Yeah. And that's, but that's just that, that's the that human element. But you don't need a test yeah. to tell you that, right? You, hey, I may have missed no. a few, right? And, and no. I've had, uh, I think it was Marvin Hudson one night came up after an at bat. I came, as I was walking up I, from first base side, walking up, he, as he walked up right behind me, he goes, hey, I just want to let you know I missed that, that last one. Hey, perfect, right? Mm -hmm. You made a mistake. Yep. Hey, that, that's it. That's, that's what you want to know, right? Because it's there's nothing wrong with that, you know? And, and you might say, hey, wasn't that pitch outside? And, and I could even say, you know what? I wish I could see it again. There's, there's a lot of ways that, uh, for me to tell you that. And, and admitting that you're wrong, there's nothing wrong with that. Again, that's why you try and do the same thing all the time because you want to eliminate your wrong things to a, a, mi a minimum or eliminate them totally. If, but we're human, so you can't. Yeah, and, and and we know going into the series who we have, right? Well, look, all right, who's behind the plate tonight? So they know, mm -hmm. you know, what what it's going to be like, right? So the pitcher and the catcher know exactly yep. what to expect so it's not something out of the ordinary. And and I think that the umpires, when when, when you were around, John, were, were more personable to the point of if you miss something, if, you know, saying something to the catcher, hey, I missed that type of thing, right? And Or just saying, hey, just yep. let them know that I missed it. That way that they're not out there showing you up because of – uh, something, something that happened, right? But you, you do see exactly. that if somebody gets pissed off, right, and they're out there, they're they're pitching and moaning about where that pitch was, this and that. I mean, you've had those interactions, right, where somebody's done that, and you've had to call a timeout and go, "Hey, have you had to, de you know, dealing with that kind of situation?" Correct? Absolutely, absolutely. More with hitters again because um, usually, from what I heard, like you know, aside from the game, pitchers like me. Um, and I don't want people to think that I, I was crazy. I mean, I had a good strike zone, but it favored, it favored pitchers. Um, because even from umpire school, I was always taught like, go out there, get the game moving, try to call strikes as often as you can. And that's just what was instilled to me. And I liked that philosophy, but, um, you know, again, I'll keep saying that word consistency. So they know that, okay, you're not going to go crazy off the plate or you're not going to do something because it's 20, nothing. I'm going to give you the same strike zone. It doesn't matter how long I stay. My kids to this day, 
are grown and they and my good friends they all tease me like yeah john you had a tough job you work three hours a day <laughs> well it wasn't really like that but i still hear it from my kids yeah and it is i mean now that you know these these new rules that they're implementing john as far as you know they're, they want to go with a bigger base they want to go with these pitch clocks they yeah. go with the direct slide where when we were playing you as long as you could reach the base i was able to you know you're able to get six feet of length outside and guy you mm -hmm. i'm sure you've sure you've seen some horrific you know flips at second base of guys but guys knew who was on base and who was coming right and you and i'm sure you probably saw some fights happen because of it and if you're if you come in too high you get a ball uh, you get a ball between your eyes i mean it, again and i i used to tell this when i was speaking or doing something but you know back when if the if the infielder made a good throw to second base we didn't care what he did. Just make it look like he touched the base. You know, come near it before, after, if it's a good throw, okay, at second. Now, if it's not a good throw, you better make darn well you go back and touch the bag. Yeah, the vicinity. So right, things like that. Now, now I mean, you know, uh, uh, here, a funny story, okay? I was in, uh, I was towards the end of my career, and I'm in Anaheim, and they were playing Houston. And uh, Albert Pujols ball back to the screen and he uh he kind of jogs down to second base and gives a courtesy slide and hops up and i barely like i barely put my arms out like he's safe and all of a sudden the houston dugout they go we want you to check that i'm like what so i walk walk by john tumpain who's now a big league umpire he spent time before he got to the big leagues on my crew great kid and um i walked by him and i mumbled john if they change this call I will kiss your butt right here at home plate. And so I walked by him, go back to the screen. And what happened was when, when Pujols stood up, he lost contact with the base for like an instant second that a third base camera caught. And they ended up reversing it and calling him out. And that's where I think replay, you know, is not, it's not what replay was intended for. So as I'm walking back to second base after I had to change the call and, you know, you're embarrassed, he said, Chief, do you want to do it now or after the game? <laughs> <laughs> and that, uh, but you're right. I mean, there was a play the other night in the World Series at second base, and there's a, an angle, camera angle, every angle of the base. So, it, so they try and show, you know, they were saying, oh, there was no dirt. There was nothing, this and that. I mean, it, it's filtered all the way down to Little League now, John. I mean, it's – Yeah. And I think the, the most recent thing I saw was a guy in minor league – it was in fall league – challenging a pitch call he was tapping his hat challenging a pitch call and they're going in to review the pitch i mean yeah. well, that's not good for the game kevin we know that i mean as being in baseball for years like both of us have and it's not it's not going to benefit the game no and, and people are, are and they want to speed the game up right that's what they talk well, yeah. now you're adding more and more more time to it you know yep. pitch clocks right i mean I, really and then what now they can only pick off so many times I just I, go to I the mound so many times. It's 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 all lawyer stuff. It's not how you fix the game. Yeah, yeah. And then you know the subs. Everybody's checking. Were they when you were when you were um, finishing up? Were they checking for the su the substance like they do now? Where they're making the guys disrobe? No. Or was that after? No, no. After I, me, I, after sixteen. I, no. <laughs> and that's that's. I mean, you know, every time the guy comes off the mound, you got to shake his hand and. I don't know. They put a lot of a lot of responsibilities on umpires. That's for sure. Above and beyond what I think our responsibilities should be. Yes, and and, and it's tough on you guys because you can't even. I mean, you know, I'm sure the, the stress levels have gone through the roof, right? Because yeah. it's just a matter. And but it, you see these guys. Um, I saw a crew at the end of the year. Rob Drake was was the crew chief. Got a chance to talk to Rob and see some of these younger guys. But you know, just it it seems like they're not as personable as you guys were where you could actually have an interaction of knowing saying hey you know introduce yourself whatever you know going going out to right mm -hmm. field you'd see a first base umpire whoever it was saying hey hey john hey paul how are you doing today good right just, just so you guys had that that interaction of knowing so if I, if there was a play or something you know it wasn't just it, it, we had more you had more of a what's the word family like? yes yes Fam it, and and i always say i'm as fortunate as anyone i always looked at baseball if you're on the field, you put a uniform on, whether you're a player, a manager, a coach, a trainer, or an umpire, 
you put a uniform on and you're on that field. You're you're a sacred, a part of the sacred baseball family. That's how I always felt. And families argue, they yell, they scream, they have disagreements, but and there's some that are really good guys, and there's some that are just quiet. Doesn't mean he's a bad guy. He just, you know, certain guys will go to the outfield and they've had their head down. Who knows why? But it doesn't make him a bad guy. I mean, I, I could count the bad guys in my in in my 41 years in professional baseball on less than one hand. I don't even need a hand to do it. And um, but I always say I'm I'm so proud that I was a part of that family. Yeah, and you still keep in touch with a lot of these guys as well. You know, that's, that's I do. I do. And and even like I, I, I talked to Mike Heath, I talked to Steve McCaddy just two weeks ago. Um, I, there's several umpires that Laz Diaz and James Hoy, Jim Reynolds. There's there's a lot of umpires like Bill Welke that I keep in touch with. And um, spring training is always fun because uh, my wife, Denise, and I are down in Florida. And a couple of those guys that are good friends are, are in the area where, where we have a home in Sarasota. So on off days, I keep it always keep it to go play golf with them and go fishing. So it's still that that friendship will be there till we die, I'm sure. Yeah, and it's and it's hard. There aren't a lot of a lot of those guys around anymore. You know, you talked about that. You know, Ted Barrett's. You know, J James is um, being there. Rob Drake, uh, Guccione, I think, still there. I think Barksdale I saw Lance Barksdale yep. the other day. So that, I mean, there's some of those guys that are there, but I think it's it's just the changing of the guard. It seems like they're just. I don't know if they're being forced out because I don't of... think so, Kevin. It's like even when I left in 16 and this is 22. So this is my sixth season out of the game. I I bet I bet at over a third close to half the umpires. I do not know, which is amazing. And now I hear there's going to be like eight to 10 guys retiring this year. Oh, really? So, yeah. In a very short amount of time, um, I won't know anybody. <laughs> Is it because of this, the new rule stuff, the, these, this quest tech umpiring system, you know, you know, we talked about when, when we were towards the end of my career, when, when, we, when we talked about it, uh, say somebody, you know, you know, right now guys pimping home runs. So you know, go up there, you drill yeah. the next guy, right? It was done, right. but you guys right. would say your hands are tied. We, you want, uh, you want us to handle this. You want us to, to police our game, but you, you uh, as an umpire, you say, our hands are tied. We can't do anything, right? We have to, as soon as something right. happens, we have to warn everybody as opposed to just getting this done and being over with. Mm -hmm. Right. And so what's the manager say, the pitcher, don't worry about it. We're, we'll see him tomorrow. We'll see him in two weeks. We play him again. We'll, We'll take care of things and instead of getting it done right then. And back in 2000, um, when there was a big changeover, and that's when, a long time ago, but that's when this all started. They're like, no, warn them immediately. And so our argument was, again, like you just said, don't you want them to police the game themselves? Like you, a guy does that, and so you drill them. You don't hit them in the head. You don't hit them in the shoulders. You, you hit them in the back or his rear end, in the leg, whatever. And then... It's over. Now, if if it continues, that's when we would step in and give warnings and, you know, and it, it, it worked good that way. I think it's just um, maybe it's like our uh, our system now with um, district attorneys and things in this country. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, now you've got these guys with full elbow guard, face guard, shin guard. Lean. He had a guy the other night yeah. leaning into a pitch. And I always thought yeah. it should have been a strike or you were out leaning into a pitch that was over the plate. It's what it, it's what it, in the umpire's judgment, what that pitch would have been. And the only thing, and, and I, I left him a, a voicemail yesterday. It was an off day. So I kind of figured his family's in New York. They wouldn't pick up, but I said, uh, first of all, great job. And I said, secondly, that was an outstanding call. Um, to make a call like that takes courage, good reaction, good feel for the game, you know, a lot of things. Seeing where that was in the strike zone is almost a step beyond. That's that's unless it's right down Broadway, as we used to say. Um, I think it was a little bit inside, might have been a strike. Um, I don't I don't know, but um, you know, just to make that call. And you know what really killed me? How about now it's three and zero, and the guy swings at a pitch out of the strike zone and grounds out. Yeah, that's what I was. I mean, people keep saying, "What did he know that it was three zero, or he thought it would have been a strike?" I mean, it was one of. The, I always thought it was an automatic strike just because of trying no. to lean into it. Just to, okay, but but if he didn't know, they do have multi-million-dollar scoreboards that he could look up at and see what the count is. 
or yeah. turn around and ask the umpire what the count was. Yeah, you're right, and that's and maybe they're. I can't. Afraid. De- I can't defend someone like that, yeah. Kevin. Yeah, I'm sorry. Exactly. exactly. You're just plain. You put the S in stupid. Exactly. I, yeah, you have some of those. Where you just. I'm sure he said nope. Hit you, get back in the box, and he didn't. I don't think the kid even argued about it. I don't think Dusty did either. When it happened, yeah. it was just a matter of. You you would have thought though if somebody would have said something, but hey. It helped help that whatever he grounded out, and that was yeah. and that was it. So I mean, it's yeah, but it's but it's you're right. It's it's become a not so much about the game. It's about the angles and technicalities. The technicalities. Yes, you know they talk about. I I always tell people they opened Pandora's box when they allowed mm-hmm. us a replay into the game, right? And they, they you did know, talk about the Astros and cheating, and they're gonna find a way to do it. Always. Right? It That's it, why there's umpires. Yes. Yes. But you also have to let us do our jobs, you know, and, and, and you can't handcuff the umpires. Like checking, going back a couple minutes ago, checking their hands when they come off the mound. If that's that important to MLB, why don't you put a guy in each dugout and just have him check the pitcher when he gets in the dugout? Why do you have to involve the umpires in that? Uh, yeah, and, and disrobing him out in the middle of the field. Right? Yeah. They were making yeah. guys, yeah. Doing um, the privacy of the dugout. Right. I mean, everybody, well, I th- you know, with with uh, the motor sticks, right, that we would have. I used to grab my my bat by the barrel, and there'd be some there'd be some sticky on there, right. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm putting, you're right. If somebody comes through there, right, it's just a part of it. It wasn't. Was I trying right. to cheat? No, I just it's just yeah. habit, right. I just grabbed it with the sticky hand. I didn't think anything of it. But granted, right. I think they do need because there are times when it's so cold out there. You know, a guy like Kenny Rogers, he's not throwing a hundred miles an hour, but if he can't feel right. the baseball. He's, he's got to put something on his hand to at least give him that to be able to hold on to it. Or if not, he's going to lose it right now, especially guys. Now they just seem to, they just throw, right. They don't I'm even grinning. I'm grinning because you just mentioned a name. I haven't thought of in a long time. My God, I used to work, love to work him behind the plate. Good old Kenny. I have to tell him he lives right down the street from me. Does he's, he really? Oh yeah. Yep. Oh, when I looked in the USA today and I saw he was starting, I had a smile ear to ear all day. Yeah. And, and you know he's going to be around at least six innings. Usually, you know, more than that. But um, yeah, I loved working him. And uh, it's the game has changed. It just it's it's changed an awful lot. It it is, and it, it's, it's like you said, from how you saw it. I mean, you saw it the infant stage of all to where you know to where it's where it's become today. Um, so we'll we'll, we'll uh, I'm going to dive in here to this. So that's why you said we talked about that. Your your grandson. You're going to have to explain it to your grandson here. Um, he yeah. was, how yeah. old is he now? Was he f- five weeks? He was five weeks. You're right. Five weeks. Look at me. Look at me. And and going into that that story a little bit, John, of, of how you got to this point of Michael John, correct? Correct. That's Michael, his name. Michael, Michael John. John. Michael yeah. John is the miracle baby of the Hirschbeck family um, because of what you guys have been through, Johnny. Which is and this take us to this while you're so you're umpiring. Correct with this. Correct. When you start going, when you start, when you found out, I'll let you explain this. Go ahead, John. Okay. Um, it goes back to 1992. Um, Denise had gone home with the two girls younger and the boys stayed. It, this, we were down in Fort Myers. The boys stayed because my parents were there for a spring training game. And it was the end of this last game of spring training. So after the game, um, we go, I get cleaned up. We go to the airport. And um, we're flying back to Pittsburgh, go home for a couple of days. And we were in first class. So I'm on the aisle. I have Michael, because he was younger, next to me, and John across the aisle. And a businessman was by the window, and he was just, you know, being nice, making conversation with my son. And I'm listening, and it was like he couldn't answer the simplest questions. And we had had a few incidents where behavior wasn't normal. So to make a long story short, we um, started having him, had a lot of testing, and we finally got to Akron Children's Hospital, and um, they did an MRI, and the doctor brought Denise and I into a room, and he said, have either of you ever had anyone die at a young age in your family? And I said, no, and Denise said, well, I had an uncle that died when he was eight during the 1930s from encephalitis, and he said, bingo. It didn't have a name back then. And they said it was encephalitis, but it was adrenal leukodystrophy. ALD is the medical abbreviation. It's a rare genetic brain disease. And it was my mother-in-law's side of the family. It's carried by females. But Denise and I, my mother-in-law just had uh, two girls, Denise and her sister. And so we had no idea. If we did back then, 
then we would not have been able to have, we've not had children. Um, so coming all the way up to now, our daughter, Megan and Aaron, both the boys, um, John did pass away when he was eight years old. They told us he'll be dead within a year and he died 11 months later in our arms in 1993. Um, and then Michael, who was, I have, I'm so proud because I have to say he was like a superstar. He had a lot of disabilities, but around the baseball field, he knew his way. People, he, I always taught him respect the uniform when you put it on and you respect the people around you. You don't look for autographs. You just do your job. And um, going back to Texas, I did, this story just came into my mind. I remember one time Johnny Oates loved Michael. And um, one time he had a seizure on the bench in spring training and he laid for the last inning. I had the plate and John said, John, I think he's okay. He's just sleeping now. And he laid on John Oates's lap in the dugout for the last inning. Um, so he was in Texas with me once and I look and he was out in your bullpen because he couldn't be on the field. So the players took him out to the bullpen and I look out there in right field and he's sitting up, you know, how the seats were over the yep. wall there looking mm -hmm. down. And he's sitting up there like he gives me a thumbs up, like, hey, Dad, I'm out here now. But um, he he bat boyed. He he never missed a game with me from manager to manager in Cleveland, Pittsburgh. Uh, spring training, never missed a game for years and years. And then at the age of 27 in 2014, um, Denise went down to his room one morning, and, and there's different medical terms for it, but he ended up having a grand mal seizure and, and suffocated in his sleep. So we lost both the boys to ALD. And Megan, when she was eight months old, my youngest daughter, Megan, is now um, an anesthesiologist at Ohio State. She was eight months old and she was Michael's bone marrow donor. Um, and that allowed Michael all those extra years because normally the, it was in the childhood form, you, you die by the age of eight. Um, so it was tragic to say the least. And I had a couple of decisions at the time, like well, I was going to retire at the end of that year, 14. And I said, well, I don't want to go out that way. I'll do 15. Um, and then I realized, okay, I'll be 62. I max out on benefits and God forbid, if I drop then tomorrow, my wife will get it for the rest of her life. So that's what made me stay till 2016. And Megan, um, she got married two years ago. And because of modern medicine, which is available now, she knew that she was a carrier of ALD. They were able to harvest eggs and they had 25 of which they do all kind of micro testing. And she ended up with uh, four perfect eggs. And that's everything from ALD to Down syndrome and three are male and um, one is a female. So she just uh, had her grandson. I get choked up, um, Michael John four weeks, five weeks ago. And my wife's getting ready to go down tomorrow because now as a senior resident, she has to interview future people. So she said, mom, I can't have Michael crying. So you're going to have to come down, you know, while she's doing these interviews uh, on the computer. So Denise is heading down tomorrow for a week. So a lot of golf and fishing here. for you. I, I've got a couple golf trips planned. Oh yeah. I got a few. <laughs> no, I'm going to play golf. We're going to supposed to have like an Indian summer. It's raining today, but an Indian summer here in Northeast Ohio. So yeah, I'll get a few golf games in so, after I do the honey-do list. Oh, exactly. So, yeah. so you're, so, and that's, you know, we talk about with, with umpires, John, you know, or anybody, you never know what somebody's going through at uh, any, no. any given moment. So you're dealing with no. Michael, right? Or, or Michael's when he was eight. So you're umpiring, right? This is during the season that you're dealing Correct. with this, right? So, I mean, the emotions and what you're dealing with, how, how hard was it even for you to concentrate, to focus on, on the task at hand when you knew the inevitable was, was at home? That's another great question. Kevin, you're good. I, if anybody ever wants to read the story and the girl that wrote it, Lisa Pollock, won the Pulitzer Prize for it. It's called The Umpire's Sons. You can Google my name and it's the umpire sons and you'll know everything about how Denise and I met in Puerto Rico and all the different things. And, um, my, uh, you know, even when I talked about being part of baseball's family in 1992, Tony La Russa in Chicago had a huge fundraiser. Um, and every big name from Don Mattingly to Bo Jackson to uh, Mark McGuire, you name it, Cal Ripken, they were all there. And, Tony said, I just want to do this for you and your family. Um, 
and it was a, a fund in the in the kids names uh, a trust to cover anything that medically that wasn't covered by my insurance with major league baseball so that's what i mean it's things like that that you know uh you just you never forget and just very very blessed i mean um Hey, Kevin, go back. I forgot what you just said or what your question was. Just as far as, you know, how you dealt with that, you know, during the season. Oh, and in that article, that's right. That's why I got sidetracked. In that article, uh, they quote me as saying, you know, how did you do it? And how I did it was I kind of loved going to the ballpark because for those three hours on the field, I could just go out and do what I loved. And nobody could bother me. I was just, I mean, players could but I was out there doing what I loved and um and then for the and I said in the article I said the other 20 hours I just dealt with my family life and you had to do this this twice John I mean it's not easy to you know this, we're not supposed to outlive our kids you know no. and it's no and it's funny because it now we have two gravestones at the cemetery with the boys and and one in the middle that has John and you know the on the maid stone and Denise and Someday we'll be there with them, but um, yeah, it's it's and it's hard. It's hard on birthdays. It's hard on anniversaries. It's, um, you know, it. And I tell people often, I'll be asked like, "Geez, how do you do it?" And I said, "Well, you have to come to terms that no day is ever going to be the same, but you have to go on, and you have to still try and be the best person you could be, the best husband, the best father, now the best grandfather." Um, it's just, uh, it's, it's that realization, you know, you, you can take the easy way and say, well, I'm going to fold up like a tent and take my ball and go home or continue on be the best person you can be. And they didn't tell you that when, when your grandson was born name or anything else, it was, that was all a, just that moment when it's, they handed, when they handed you your grandson. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I, they wouldn't tell us they, and I'm like, Megan, come on, you know? And, and, um, they both live in Columbus, um, and and I'm like, you want? They go no. And then one time, I got a little testy, and then he said, call them back and tell them you're sorry. And I and I called her husband Hunter, and I said, listen, you know me. Sometimes I I my temper, I I say the wrong thing, and I apologize to you. Um, he said, John, just trust me, trust us to do the right thing. And with that, I still didn't know, but I had a good feeling, you know, that it would be named after her brothers, our. Uh, our son so we're, we're just thankful to god and that's what it was she just said here's your grandson here's here's my here's john. michael john what was your first thought holding that grandson oh uh, my god just tears tears i was just so happy and so proud i mean had had the boys it's it's kind of like when we went on michael's michael's birthday he would be 36 years old um just um, October 23rd, and we were at the cemetery, and I said, you know, it's amazing, Denise, because by the boys dying and being there now, you know, the new new page, God gave us Michael John, and we can be grandparents, and we never, ever thought we would have a grandchild, never. Yeah, I mean, it's everything always happens for a reason. I've always lived by that yeah. motto and understand that and seeing that. Yeah, I remember the, the enthusiasm you had of when you reached, we reached out on, on Facebook, just reaching out how excited you were. I've got a grandson coming and, yeah. and this and that. And, you know, and, yeah. and I could tell it was just the emotion and everything else of seeing that. Now, you know, you get to, you know, to watch him grow up now and, and explain to yeah. him what you did and, and the people that were around you and, and you know, why – he's able to be here because of, you know, this, what happened 25 years ago, right. To be able to do that. And exactly. And, and, and to exactly. tell that, who's, who's the, to know what, uh, what the what, cycle of life, right. Exactly. You never know. That's why you keep going. You don't give up and do the best you can. And the, the really good news is they're in Columbus now because Megan is a fourth year anesthesiology student at Wexter medical center, Ohio state. And her husband Hunter is a fourth year orthopedic surgeon. So he's got another year. And then he has to do a fellowship. But in two and a half years, they're going to move back to this area. So I told her I'd put a pool in out here for her um, and the baby. And um, my wife's been asking for five years. And I, and I used to tease her and say, just go swimming in the lake. It's right out there. <laughs> so now Megan gets a pool with the baby. So I just can't wait till they move back to this area. And it's that's what it's about, right? You can just get to 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 love on them and and see them all oh, the yeah. time. I know you said you spend a lot of time, you know, half your time down in in Florida, in Sarasota, and stuff. You said the house is all right after the hurricane and everything. Yeah, we're very lucky. 
very lucky. Went down two weeks ago with a buddy and we did the list of things to get done, took the hurricane shutters off and um, we were very fortunate, very fortunate. And, and it just, I never forget seeing those pictures of Fort Myers and I thought, my God, it looks worse than Ukraine when you used to see the places blown out by the Russians. It's terrible. Yeah, and it's just glad that you said that, that everything was, you know, okay. I haven't, like I said, I haven't kept up with how it's been down there. Like I said, you, you saw it yeah. firsthand. Of, it's going to um, be years. I, I think Naples, a friend of mine is a fireman down there, and I talked to him. He said Naples is pretty much back to normal. And, of course, we are up by the Sarasota area, Venice. But um, Fort Myers, I, I, I've heard it's going to be years before they get built back. Well, yeah, my aunt and uncle live in uh, Englewood. I mean, have some family and friends that are over there as well. Just on the just outside of Port Charlotte because it got hit pretty good too, from what I've yeah, what I've gathered. Did. Yeah, um, but we're right just, up the road from you, Kevin. So if you get down there this winter with your family, you got to give me a holler for sure. I got three kids going everywhere, John. I didn't have time to really go. Ah, uh, that's right. I, I remember could, those days. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I waited until I was done playing before I before I had them. But we're going. I get two yeah. eighth graders and a third grader, so it's we go busy, we go busy. nonstop. Try and get out as much as we can and and. and play golf as much as we can so you know it seems like that's yeah. what you're doing the fishing is yeah. do you take fishing over golf or which one would you rather do i that's a tough call but i'd probably take golf over fishing ah. i really love it and and i've really just started playing since since i retired you know and i i kind of look at it like my bow hunting like i love shooting my bow and practicing well i'm the kind of guy that can hit golf balls for two three hours and and enjoy doing that so and you I'm never played really a lot into it. when you were when you were umpiring. You didn't play much, a little bit. But it's again the kind of thing. Even if I came home like on an off week, I might get together with my buddies and go play golf, drink a few beers. But then I'd be on the road for five weeks. You know, wouldn't touch clubs. Yeah. So n never anything to get going. I played at I played golf, but I didn't start working at it until I retired. See. The life of it. It's like a starting pitcher, John. You know, they they take the oh, club. they have the life. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that's what it's about, though. That's that's why they have yeah. no excuse for being for being. So, who was the best golfer of, of all the umpires that you that you worked with? Um, let me think. Field and Culbreth, back in my day when we were playing uh, Cubby, was a was a good golfer. Really? And yeah, I look yeah. at fielding. I just don't see it. I look at no. just the body type. <laughs> I look at it. I just I don't see it. I see maybe like like James Hoy, type of thing. No, um, no, no, not James. No. <laughs> fielding Colbert. Wow, I didn't. I would never yeah. have thought that. Yeah, and um, there's um, oh um, there's a couple good young guys now that are that are good golfers. Um, but back when I was, I, I'd say Cubby was the best golfer. Wow. That's maybe yep. they should have to they should create it. I know I think the major league players they have one too. They have the World Series of Golf. They should have the umpires do one as well and see how that would turn out. They players have the World Series of Golf? I think they do. Don't they go out there? I know Schmoltz and those guys go play out in California. Now he's so, a good player. Yes. Yeah, he's a good player. There's a lot of those. They're all starting pitchers. There's no excuse. Kenny Rogers, and you know, great golfer. Those you guys, think when when my kids I remember going to Oakland and playing, and we would have those 12, 15 games and we'd run out to a course. And and I whenever I was there, Kenny Rogers was there, so he would do the same thing. Oh yeah, nothing like a nothing like a day game, twelve fifteen in Oakland. Yeah, I mean we'd be out of there in less than two and a half hours, and on the course play eighteen before it was dark. That was back when the pitch they weren't even going to pitch that series, even if it was a three game series, they weren't even pitching. They would just go. Well, I'm going just to play golf. That's why they were going to go yeah. out and, and show. Oh yeah, up, so. oh yeah. Yeah, and you we, know, my kids tease me about only working three hours a day. Imagine what the kids of a starting pitcher say. Well, Dad, you work three hours every five days if you last that's probably going to change it's probably going to be every seven here the way that the way that the sport's going you're going to have yeah. seven man rotations and guys don't go yeah, more than three innings yeah. right and it's uh, yeah it's tough like i said you i'll give i'll let you explain that to your grandson sitting there watching all this stuff so yeah but you did there yeah. were some... or or instead we'll turn the game off and go fishing how's that or golfing you, you can do that to, i can I, I i bet you have one of those little floaties right you're, you're gonna put him next to you you're gonna go wade in the water and tie him down and just sit there and fish with him and just watch oh, yeah. it right yeah exactly he'll yes, be sir he'll be hunting fishing golfing doing all that stuff That's he'll right. be a full-on and i i said that before we knew before we knew it was the, the sex of the child i said i don't care boy or girl i said i'm going to teach him to hunt fish golf and be a good person so you found you found that was it uh, i guess i can't even imagine the emotion as soon as she called did she do it did they do it oh, in yeah. person or was it one of those where it was a reveal or just how'd they do it? it 
We did it at our house. They were home and we had her husband Hunter, his parents were over here and they did it with the cupcakes. Um, and I'm colorblind, so I was at a disadvantage. <laughs> no, they did it that way, and we were we were just we were so excited. Um, <laughs> so am I, and, right? Uh, we all had to see the white thing. That's all that mattered. That's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yep. And that's good. So we just... drove down. We actually drove, Denise and I drove down. We were going to leave a little bit later in the day, and we found out she was um, starting to dilate. So my wife is like, "Well, let's just go." I'm like, "Yeah, let's go." So we were down there, and um, at their house, waiting for the word and. Then they called us, and we went running right over there. <laughs> you probably sped right over there and didn't didn't even. We probably didn't even know you were driving. You were on cloud uh, nine. You were so hot with all this. Couldn't couldn't wait to get there and see them. That's... And my wife actually, like I said, she's going down again for the week to help Megan out, and she's been down uh, six five out of five out of five weeks. But Columbus is just two and a half hours from here, so it's not bad. You didn't want to go down. I can't. We have two German short hair pointers. <laughs> I can't. So I can't leave them by themselves. Otherwise, I would be there. Uh, okay. You can figure out a way somehow with all that, though. Yeah. Yeah. So for sure. Well, John, man, I appreciate you coming on today and and uh, and Kevin, it was an honor. telling the really. story. And kind of, I always thought of you as a great guy, <laughs> good ball player, greater man, and that's why when you asked me, I said in an absolute second I would do this, and so it's really good to talk yeah it's fun just to get on here and catch up john it's been a while you look this you look the same i'm just used to you with with the black shirt on and usually having your having your hat and whatnot so yeah you still have any of your gear do you just throw it all away or do you build yourself a little shrine on the wall or what you know what no 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 (laughs) we um two years ago when COVID started we started um a charity organization called the magical michael and um we deal with akron children's hospital and uh, in North, Northeast Ohio, children that are, um, have disabilities and underprivileged helping. And um, we've done everything from uh, dogs, companion dogs, to electric wheelchairs, to ramps. I mean, you name it. We've done all kinds of different things. Um, we do a Christmas program where uh, Denise and my, my daughter Erin buy gifts for the families of, um, of kids with uh, serious illnesses. So two years ago, I said, I've got all this memorabilia that I just collected from being in the game, like George Bush's autograph, you know, mm-hmm. picture, things that you just say, okay, there's the opportunity, absolutely. And um, I didn't, so I came up with the idea. I said, you know, if I can sell all this and make some money that could go to the Magic of Michael, um, and I had to put my name out there, but I said, anyone in the game would understand that I'm not getting a dime from it. It's all going to a charity. I don't think I'd have any problem, you know, with with people in the game. So we ended up raising uh, $154,000, and that all went to the Magic of Michael. Um, but, you know, in the past, we've had different guests. Um, we only have done it three years because of COVID. So Joe Torrey has been here, uh, Jim Tomei, um, and uh, Jim Leland, uh, who am I forgetting? Um, but we've had some really good names. We have a dinner, and then we have a golf outing. And um, we've, we've raised, uh, you know, we, we probably have over $400,000 in, in the charity. Um, so it's, it's been real good, and we're looking forward to cranking it back up again this year. So that keeps us busy. When, after doing our daughter's wedding, I say that's like planning two weddings in one summer. It's it's keeps us very busy but we have a great committee everybody volunteers and we have more than enough people to help us out so you have to send me the information johnny on that on the golf stuff you turn it you can have a hunting trip you could do a fishing trip as well figuring out get the kids out and you know doing yeah yeah and there's a it's really neat because there's a um it's called on target it's right here in campfield ohio and it's not a ministry or anything but it's more like a place where they're just trying to raise kids to be good people and good values and everything. So they'll bring buses in from Youngstown where kids have never fished, never even seen a lake before. And then we built a ramp there so that kids in wheelchairs can go up, you know, on there and fish in their pond. And they teach them everything from how to bait the hook to how to clean and eat the fish and just a really good organization. So, you know, there are things like that that we do. And if people want it, it's called uh, magicofmichael.com. Got it. Perfect. Right, Denise? Dot com. Yeah, I want to make sure I did the dot right. Yeah, 
MagicalMichael.com. Okay, and all the stuff's on there. MagicalMichael.com, and there's stories in there about past. There's pictures of the kids. There's there's uh, People would have fun looking at it. Yeah. When's your golf outing set for? We don't have it. No, that's November's project. We don't have it set. It'll be next summer, um, hopefully in July or early August. But um, my golf pro, a friend of mine, had just had uh, surgery the other day. So as soon as he gets back on his wheels, we'll, we're going to start talking about it and book a date. Perfect. So we'll be able to keep me informed on all that, John. We'll be able to. I will, Kevin. Uh, to do that. And like I said, love to help I out will. any way we can. I know like you talked about the family. We just actually had our baseball, our, our Players Alumni Association golf outing a couple of weeks ago. So raising money for, oh, for charity. Oh, that was fun. Oh, it was. Seeing a lot of the guys uh, yeah. and, and doing that. Yeah. And ours has been running for about 26 years now. Jack Lazorko is our chapter president here. So it's. I yeah. remember that name. Yep. Lazorko. Yep. He was a he was a pitcher. He played like a goalie. Yep. <laughs> so I remember him as a yeah. I remember him as yes, a pitcher. Yep. So yeah. So it's it's you know you said the family you get to get around and be around because there were only you know only so many of us that played same just like with you guys with umpires and everything else there was only so many so we we kind of got to stick together with yep. all that so it's a very 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 great family to yep. be a part of so. But Johnny, I appreciate everything like you said doing coming on here telling your story and with, wish you nothing but the best of luck especially with your grandson, your fishing and uh Thanks so anytime much, you want to kill and kill something with that bow or whatnot, you want to cook, yeah. just let me know. Thanks, I can buddy. I can always eat. So take yeah, care John and I will, uh, will, will I'll be in touch, all right? Please do, Kevin. I, take care of yourself. Yes sir, you too. Thanks John. I appreciate it.